Today we're going to look at the renowned ancient philosopher, Greek philosopher, Socrates. Socrates lived from 469 to 399 BC in Athens, Greece. He's well known for the Socratic method, if you've ever heard of this. This is uh, the Socratic method involves the power of a question. You can easily practice Socratic method by asking, what do you mean by that? Or why do you hold that view? Or how do you know? Socrates encourages us to know thyself. He wrote nothing. His student Plato is our source for what he said. He emphasized character and virtue and wisdom through an openness in exploration, a willingness to admit that you don't know what you think you know and that we need to continue to pursue understanding in order to grasp wisdom and understand goodness and beauty. His father was a sculptor and his mother was a midwife and in many ways he saw himself as a sort of sculptor and midwife. A sculptor begins with rock, not being able to see form or line or image, but chisels away at that rock until the form becomes apparent. So too, Socrates chiseled away at ideas until he could begin to see form and line and a clearer portrait of understanding within them. The midwife does not birth the child. She comes alongside the one who is giving birth and helps to make the process as efficient as possible. So too, Socrates, portrait of a teacher, comes alongside the philosopher. It's the philosopher's job, it's your job to give birth to your own reasons, to understand your own ideas. He cannot reach your conclusions for you. He saw himself as helping you wrestle with ideas and arguments until they eventually take shape and you're able through labor together, though you are doing most of the work, to give birth to a better understanding. And this is the Socratic method. How does he help you? Through questioning. The Socratic method is a dialectical method. Now that's a fancy word and we're going to get the definition for that in a moment. But just know up front that Socratic method and dialectics are synonymous. He was known for not being very attractive. He was known for his humor. He was a soldier. He was known for his intensity also his poverty. He had a family, but no money. And he stressed moderation. So he was an ancient Greek moral philosopher. He went on to teach. Uh, he was the teacher of Plato. And he was well known for professing ignorance, that he knew nothing. He was well known for his sarcasm and emphasis upon irony. And he was known for his earnestness to seek truth, as well as his dialectical method of investigation. In the point in time in which Socrates comes on the scene and is followed by Plato and then Aristotle, we call these the Socratic philosophers or the Socratics. This is also the golden age of Athens. But philosophy had begun prior to Socrates. These philosophers we call the pre-Socratics. Ancient philosophy began with a conviction of telos, which is the idea that, that there is a purpose to nature, and entwined with this notion of purpose is order. There is a grand harmonic or grand cosmic order to all things. And so philosophy really began as a quest to understand this, and ancient philosophy assumed a confidence that the truth can be known about this grand order. It was Pythagoras who first called himself a lover of wisdom. And the Pythagoreans were intuitively aware of the importance of order and harmony throughout the universe and the importance of number and understanding it. Now when we look at the history of philosophy there is an interesting trend and we might call this the line of uncertainty or the line of skepticism. And that trend is this. Philosophy begins with inquiry, 
Inquiry assumes that there is something to be known, that something can be known. Inquiry eventually leads to greater understanding, and this gives us confidence. Eventually, our confidence meets a counterpoint. So some philosophies had begun exploring the world. They were coming up with ideas. They were starting to feel pretty confident about some of these ideas, and then new ideas came up, counterpoint. Now there's tension, and this makes us step back and question our perspective. Sometimes we doubt ourselves. So counterpoint leads to doubt, and this doubt, what you do with doubt, is a big question. Many times this doubt shakes people up and leads to skepticism. Now once you get to skepticism, again, there are different ways that you can approach that. You can be a, a softer skeptic or a harder skeptic, but depending on what you do with your skepticism, skepticism can easily lead to relativism. Relativism is the view that what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me. Why would you come to that conclusion? Well, we begin with the certainty that there is something to be known, that we can have truth. We're confident. But then we come across different ideas. We begin to doubt our conception of truth. So we start to doubt, why well, think that I'm right, or why think that anyone is right? I just see things from my perspective, you see things from your perspective, so maybe there is no truth to be known, or maybe no one could know it if it is there. Thus, we fall to relativism. You have your views on truth, I have my views on truth, that's all there is. This is especially dangerous when we add ethics into the equation. What's true for you morally, what's right or good for you to do, or bad or wrong or evil. You have your view on that, I have mine. There is no ultimate way that I should act, or no ultimate right or wrong. Now, it's easy from skepticism to find your way to relativism. Uh, there's another variable that happens in history that can get us to the same conclusion, and that is uh, the counterpoint may come not from somebody challenging our belief necessarily or directly, but from the fact that we see so many other beliefs. So when there's a pluralism, we see so many different views out there, that too can cause us to step back and say, wow, there's so many views on truth. Why would I think that mine is the right way? And you see that we can quickly slide into skepticism. And if we have no confidence that our view is the right way, there's just a bunch of views, we can easily fall to a, not necessarily a you do you, but a to each their own kind of thing. That group has their view on truth, and that group has their view on truth. So we still fall into relativism, whether it's a subjective, individual form of relativism or a cultural relativism, it's easy to get there once we have reached the point of skepticism. And indeed, this happened prior to the Socratics. We began with the, the Pythagoreans, and others came along, we are confident, we have a lot of ideas that we can know what we know, but eventually people start to raise questions and offer arguments that were causing some people to take a step back. For example, from geometry, from what the Pythagoreans laid out there, we know that a line can be divided an infinite number of times. Well, if that's the case, if I were to walk a straight line to the door, before I could go the whole distance to the door, I would have to go half the distance. Before I could go half the distance, I would have to go half of that distance. But before I could go half of that distance, I would have to go half of that distance. And we can keep dissecting the line between myself and the door, and if I always have to go half the distance before I can ever go the whole distance, I would eventually never move. So this and other arguments were being offered that were making people say, wow, I don't know what's going on. Why think that my view is correct? And in this context, some people were even suggesting that maybe there is nothing to be known or nothing that we can know beyond the physical world. Maybe the physical world is all there is. Well, from that skepticism, we have the rise of the sophists. So the sophists were both skeptics. They did not believe in ultimate higher truth, and they were relativists, moral relativists, believing that truth is in the eye of the beholder. There is no ultimate way it should be, no ultimate right or wrong. The sophists had a reputation. They were masters of rhetoric. If there is no ultimate truth to be known, 
and philosophy began as the quest to know what is true, then what is to become a philosophy? Well, it becomes a mastery of language, language games. So the sophists were masters of rhetoric, and they were known for the art of persuasive speaking. So if you wanted to learn how to turn any argument to your advantage, how to win over a crowd, you would go and pay a sophist to teach you to be a master wordsmith. They were known for their ability to turn weaker arguments into stronger ones. It doesn't matter if it's true, false, victory goes to the most eloquent speaker. As with the trial of Socrates, many things were decided by mass crowds, and one's ability to win over the crowd often came down not to the issues or to the truth of matters, but to smooth talking. Does that sound familiar? Isn't this how politics often seems to work in our own context? They had many techniques for teaching and speaking, but again, they were ultimately skeptics when it came to knowledge. They were well acquainted with other cultures, and they were familiar with the fact that there is a diversity of perspectives out there. They were also moral relativists, as one of them famously said that man is the measure of all things. Each one determines his or her own truth. The Socratics, namely Socrates, followed by Plato, followed by Aristotle, strongly opposed the sophists and their relativism. The Socratics fought to defend objective, universal, knowable truth. Naturally, Socrates hung out with sophists in order to evaluate the content of their arguments in his search for wisdom. Because he hung out with them, he was later accused of being one. But although he considered many sophists friends, they did not share the same interests. Socrates was interested in truth, whereas the sophists denied that knowledge of truth was possible, or even that there is a truth to know. There were also some practical differences. Sophists would not teach you unless you paid them. Philosophy was a business. Philosophy for Socrates, however, was a quest. And so he took no pay and was willing to dialogue with anyone. He did not consider himself a teacher, having students to whom he passed off wisdom, because he considered himself to be still searching for wisdom. While we do call Plato his student or disciple, uh, in the sense that Plato learned from Socrates and called Socrates his teacher, Socrates would not have considered himself the teacher of Plato, but rather Plato's equal and dialogical partner in their quests for wisdom. The quest of Socrates was all about dialogue, and the dialectical process was helpful in reaching for wisdom because the antagonism between two views caused those views to wrestle together until they found a sort of synthesis or until they arrived together at a clearer understanding of what truth might entail. The genre of Plato's style of writing is called the dialogue. Rather than writing in essay form, as we do in our term papers, Plato's works read more like a movie script, where one person says something and then someone else replies, or like a monologue in which one person is recounting a conversation with others, but rather than saying to the reader, this is what you need to know, the reader is presented with a dialogue that has taken place in order to glean truth simply from reading through the dialectical process and seeing how the differing perspectives labored together until they were finally able to give birth to a clearer understanding of the concept or definition with which they were wrestling. So the dialectic or dialectical process is the same as the Socratic method. Dialectic comes from the Greek for conversation. A dialectic is a back and forth conversational exchange that uses the power of questioning to sharpen ideas, to expose contradiction, and to further philosophical dialogue. As the old proverb says, iron sharpens iron, so too one person sharpens another. 
An original idea, the thesis, is put forward and discussed until a contrary idea, an antithesis, arises. The dialogue then continues until a new idea emerges, this is called the synthesis, which is able to account for all that has been said and move the dialogue forward. Socrates is careful to claim that he knows anything, yet some things have stood fast for him. He believed that we ought to search for truth. He also believed that knowledge is somehow connected to human excellence, and so if the good is connected to knowing, then bad or wrongdoing must be the product of ignorance. Now some might take issue with this because you could know wrong and do wrong knowing that you should not do that. This would suggest that badness or wrongness is not ignorance, but something else. Nevertheless, because excellence is connected to knowledge and human goodness is connected to human excellence, Socrates stressed the importance of moral education because the wiser we become, the better we will understand how we ought to live. He had three core teachings. The unexamined life is not worth living. The most important thing of all is to care for your soul, and a good person cannot really be harmed. Therefore, it would be better to suffer injustice than to do injustice. Let's pause to read an excerpt from Plato's Republic, wherein Socrates and Thrasymachus are in dialogue together, while others are standing by listening, and they are attempting to reach a satisfactory definition of justice. This is a dialogue between Socrates and others, and Socrates is recounting who said what to him and how he responded. Behold, he said, the wisdom of Socrates. He refuses to teach himself and goes about the learning of others, to whom he never even says thank you. That I learn of others, I replied, is quite true, but that I am ungrateful, I wholly deny. Money I have none, and therefore I pay in praise, which is all I have, and how ready I am to praise anyone who appears to me to speak well. You will very soon find out when you answer, for I expect that you will answer well. Listen, then, he said, I proclaim that justice is nothing else than the interest of the stronger. And now why do you not me? But of course you won't. Let me first understand you, I replied. Justice, as you say, is in the interest of the stronger. What, Thrasymachus, is the meaning of this? You cannot mean to say that because Polydamus the Pancratius is stronger than we are and finds the eating of beef conducive to his bodily strength, that to eat beef is therefore equally for our good, who are weaker than he is, and right and just for us? That's abominable of you, Socrates. You take the words in the sense which is most damaging to the argument. Not at all, my good sir, I said. I'm trying to understand them, and I wish that you would be a little clearer. Well, he said, have you never heard that forms of government differ? There are tyrannies, and there are democracies, and there are aristocracies. Yes, I know. And the government is the ruling power in each state? Certainly. And the different forms of government make laws democratical, aristocratical, tyrannical, with a view to their several interests. And these laws which are made by them for their own interests are the justice which they deliver to their subjects. And him who transgresses them they punish as a breaker of the law and unjust. And that is what I mean when I say that in all states there is the same principle of justice, which is the interest of the government. And as the government must be supported to have power, the only reasonable conclusion is that everywhere there is one principle of justice, which is in the interest of the stronger. Now I understand you, I said. And whether you are right or not, I will try to discover. But let me remark that in defining justice, you have yourself used the word interest, which you forbade me to use. It is true, however, that in your definition, the words of the stronger are added. A small addition you must allow, he said. 
Great or small, never mind about that. We must first inquire whether what you are saying is the truth. Now we are both agreed that justice is interest of some sort. But you go on to say, of the stronger. About this addition I am not so sure, and must therefore consider further. Proceed. I will. And first tell me, do you admit that it is just for subjects to obey their rulers? I do. But are the rulers of states absolutely infallible, or are they sometimes liable to err? To be sure, he replied, they are liable to err. Then in making their laws, they may sometimes make them rightly and sometimes not? True. When they make them rightly, they make them agreeably to their interest, when they are mistaken, contrary to their interest. You admit that? Yes. And the laws which they make must be obeyed by their subjects. And that is what you call justice? Doubtless. Then justice, according to your argument, is not only obedience to the interest of the stronger, but the reverse. What is that you are saying? he asked. I am only repeating what you are saying, I believe. But let us consider. Have we not admitted that the rulers may be mistaken about their own interest in what they command, and also that to obey them is justice? Has that not been admitted? Yes. Then you must also have acknowledged justice not to be for the interest of the stronger when the rulers unintentionally command things to be done which are to their own injury. For if, as you say, justice is the obedience which the subject renders to their commands, in that case, O wisest of men, is there any escape from the conclusion that the weaker are commanded to do what is not for the interest, but what is for the injury of the stronger? Nothing can be clearer, Socrates, said Polemarchus. So what is justice? According to Thrasymachus, justice is nothing but the interest of the stronger. But Socrates presses, can the stronger be mistaken, or are they infallible, unable to make mistakes? If the stronger can be mistaken and command things that are not in their interest, but justice involves doing what they command, then justice would, in that case, involve doing, because they command it, what is not actually in their interest, because they were mistaken. In this case, justice means both that which is in the interest of the stronger and that which is to the injury of the stronger. That's a contradiction. So this process of reducing lines of arguments down to absurd conclusions is called reductio ad absurdum, reducing to the absurd conclusion. And this was a favored method of Socrates. Socrates was also a fan of irony and sarcasm, and I'm sure that you can pick up on that. Does not every art serve an interest? Medicine is an art in service to the body, not to medicine. Horsemanship is interested in horses, not in horsemanship. Likewise, there is no ruler without subjects. The ruler, then, must be concerned to some extent with the interests of the people, and not solely self-interest. Now I want to consider the trial and death of Socrates, and read excerpts from his trial. So Plato tells the story of the end of Socrates' life across four stories. Euthyphro gives us many treasures, including a glimpse into Socrates' nature. Even as Socrates arrives to court, he is still more interested in dialogue than in worrying about what fate may lie in store for him. He runs into his friend Euthyphro, and they start to dialogue over the nature and definition of piety or righteousness. Then, in the Apology, Socrates gives his defense. Apology comes from the Greek word apologia, which means not to apologize, not to say you're sorry, but to give a defense. This is a courtroom term. So the apology, Plato's apology, is the recounting of Socrates' trial. After he is declared guilty and the punishment is death by hemlock, 
Crito tells the story of the friends of Socrates coming to rescue him. They had arranged for some of the higher-ups in the city to turn a blind eye to look away as Socrates was secretly taken out of the city in order to escape this unjust fate. But Socrates, being Socrates, rather than worrying about his own fate, uses this opportunity to dialogue with his friends over the nature of justice and whether it would be just for him to escape. At the end of their dialogue, his students admit that they can find no argument to refute his claim that it would actually be an injustice for Socrates to leave the city rather than to stay. And so Socrates stays to serve out his sentence. Finally, the Phaedo is the account of Socrates' final scene. His friends come to visit him one last time, and as you might expect, Socrates is ready to discuss a few things further, like goodness and the soul, and then he drinks the hemlock and fades into death, popping up one last time before dying to ask a friend to pay someone a chicken that Socrates still owes them. When he arrives to court, he runs into his pal Euthyphro, who asks why Socrates is at court. Socrates goes over the charges against him, that he doesn't believe in the city's gods, that he has been introducing other gods, that he's been corrupting the youth. He asks why Euthyphro is at court. Euthyphro recounts the story of how someone had broken into his father's house, his father overpowered them, tied them up, threw them in a ditch, and went to town to see what he should do with him. By the time he got back, the person had died. And so Euthyphro is here to prosecute his father. Justice should be served. His father's guilty. Socrates, loving sarcasm, says, Wow, I should become your student. You clearly know a lot about justice since you are so ready to prosecute your father. Socrates also mentions a sign that he received that has been driving much of his philosophical journey. So the question in the Euthyphro dialogue is the question of piety. What is piety or righteousness? Socrates thinks Euthyphro might be able to answer it because he clearly understands justice. And he needs an answer because you must know what justice is in order to serve justice. And if justice involves righteousness or piety, then you must have a good idea of what is pious or what is righteous. He presses Euthyphro to formulate his idea, and Euthyphro attempts to do so four different times. Each time, Socrates applies the reductio absurdum, and they come to a point in which he sarcastically says, oh, we must have made a mistake. You didn't mean to end up here. Clearly, this doesn't work, but I know you know what you're talking about, so let's go back to the top and start again. This happens several times. Finally, after the fourth attempt, Euthyphro says, you know what? Somebody's calling me. I gotta go. And he evades Socrates rather than giving him a satisfactory answer. First, he attempts to suggest that piety involves prosecuting the wrongdoer. This is not the right kind of answer, so Socrates says we've got to press deeper than this. In his second attempt, he says, well, piety is that which is dear to the gods. But Socrates points out that the gods quarrel, so that can't be right, because then it would follow that what is dear to one god may be despised by another. So this will not work. The same thing could be both pious and impious if piety means that which the gods hold dear. The third attempt is quite famous. This is what philosophers call the Euthyphro dilemma. Trying to correct his mistake with the second attempt, Euthyphro says, well, piety is that which all the gods love. Now Socrates famously presses him into a dilemma. He asks whether the gods love what is pious because it is pious, or is something pious because they love it? In the first case, if they love something because it is pious, then something is pious without them. It, now it seems like there's something even bigger than the gods, piety. They say, wow, got to get me some of that. That's why they love it. Or is something pious simply because they love it? And again, different gods might love different things, so we're back to the other problem. This third attempt 
only gives an external characteristic of piety, the gods favor piety. But it doesn't really tell us anything about what piety is. So it's unsatisfactory, you've got to start over. With the fourth attempt, Euthyphro suggests that the pious is part of the just. This may involve service to the gods, this may involve prayer and sacrifice. Well, now this is starting to sound like piety is that which they love. If they love service to them, if they love prayer and they love sacrifice, then is not piety the same as what they love? Well, now we're back to the third problem and the question of whether the gods love something because it is good or is it good simply because they love it. Finally, Euthyphro flees. Next, we have the Apology of Socrates. Let's pause to read through it. This is a speech that Socrates made as a matter of history. In the words of Norman Melchert in his seventh edition of The Great Conversation, it is generally believed the apology was written not long after the event. Many Athenians would remember the actual speech, and it would be a poor way to vindicate Plato's master which is the obvious intent, to put a completely different speech into Socrates' mouth. Some liberties could no doubt be allowed, but the main arguments and the general tone of the defense must surely be faithful to the original. Athenian juries were very large, in this case 501, and they combined the duties of jury and judge, as we know them by both convicting and sentencing. Obviously, it would have been virtually impossible for so large a body to discuss various penalties and decide on one. The problem was resolved rather neatly, however, by having the prosecutor, after conviction, assess the penalty he thought appropriate, followed by a counter-assessment by the defendant. The jury would then decide between the two. Thus, the apology has three parts. The first and major part is the main speech, followed by the counter-assessment, and finally, the last words to the jury. Reading streamlined excerpts from Plato's Apology, or the Trial of Socrates. How you, O Athenians, have been affected by my accusers, I cannot tell. But I know that they almost made me forget who I was. So persuasively did they speak, and yet they have hardly uttered a word of truth. Well then, I must make my defense, and endeavor to clear away in a short time a slander which has lasted a long time. I will begin at the beginning and ask what is the accusation which has given rise to the slander of me. Men of Athens, this reputation of mine has come of a certain sort of wisdom which I possess. If you ask me what kind of wisdom, I reply, wisdom such as may perhaps be attained by man, for to that extent I am inclined to believe that I am wise, whereas the persons of whom I was speaking have a superhuman wisdom, which I may fail to describe because I have it not myself. And he who says that I have speaks falsely and is taking away my character. And here, O men of Athens, I must beg you not to interrupt me, even if I seem to say something extravagant, for the word which I will speak is not mine. I will refer you to a witness who is worthy of credit. That witness shall be the God of Delphi. He will tell you about my wisdom, if I have any, and of what sort it is. You must have known Cherophon. He was early a friend of mine, and also a friend of yours, for he shared in the recent exile of the people and returned with you. Well, Cherophon, as you know, was very impetuous in all his doings, and he went to Delphi and boldly asked the oracle to tell him whether, as I was saying, I must beg you not to interrupt, he asked the oracle to tell him whether anyone was wiser than I. And the Pythian prophetess answered that there was no man wiser. Cherophon is dead himself, but his brother who is in court will confirm the truth of what I am saying. Why do I mention this? Because I am going to explain to you why I have such an evil name. When I heard the answer, I said to myself, What can the god mean? And what is the interpretation of this riddle? For I know that I have no wisdom, small or great. What then can he mean when he says that I am the wisest of men? And yet he is a god and cannot lie. That would be against his nature. 
After long consideration, I thought of a method of trying the question. I reflected that if I could only find a man wiser than myself, then I might go to the god with a refutation in my hand. I should say to him, Here is a man who is wiser than I am, but you said that I was the wisest. Accordingly, I went to one who had the reputation of wisdom and observed him. His name I need not mention. He was a politician whom I selected for an examination. And the result was as follows. When I began to talk with him, I could not help thinking that he was not really wise. Although he was thought wise by many and still wiser by himself, and thereupon I tried to explain to him that he thought himself wise, but was not really wise. And the consequence was that he hated me, and his enmity was shared by several who were present and heard me. So I left him, saying to myself as I went away, Well, although I do not suppose that either of us knows anything really beautiful and good, I am better off than he is, for he knows nothing and thinks that he knows. I neither know nor think that I know. In this latter particular, then, I seem to have slightly the advantage of him. Then I went to another who had still higher pretensions of wisdom, and my conclusion was exactly the same, whereupon I made another enemy of him and of many others beside him. Then I went to one man after another, being not unconscious of the enmity which I provoked, and I lamented and feared this. But necessity was laid upon me. The word of God, I thought, ought to be considered first. And I said to myself, Go, I must, to all who appear to know, and find out the meaning of the oracle. And I swear to you, Athenians, by the dog I swear, for I must tell you the truth, the result of my mission was this. I found that the men most in repute were all but the most foolish, and that others less esteemed were really wiser and better. I will tell you the tale of my wanderings, and of the Herculean labors, as I may call them, which I endured only to find at last the oracle irrefutable. After the politicians I went to the poets, tragic, dithyrambic, and all sorts. And there I said to myself, you will be instantly detected. Now you will find out that you are more ignorant than they are. Accordingly, I took some of the most elaborate passages in their own writings and asked what was the meaning of them, thinking that they would teach me something. Will you believe me? I am almost ashamed to confess the truth, but I must say that there is hardly a person present who would not have talked better about their poetry than they did themselves. Then I knew that not by wisdom do poets write, but by a sort of genius and inspiration. They are like diviners and soothsayers who also say many fine things, but do not understand the meaning of them. The poets appeared to me to be much in the same case. And I further observed that upon the strength of their poetry, they believed themselves to be the wisest of men in other things in which they were not wise. So I departed, conceiving myself to be the superior to them for the same reason that I was superior to the politicians. At last I went to the artisans, for I was conscious that I knew nothing at all, as I may say, and I was sure that they knew many fine things, and here I was not mistaken. For they did know many things of which I was ignorant, and in this they certainly were wiser than I was. But I observed that even the good artisans fell into the same error as the poets. Because they were good workmen, they thought that they also knew all sorts of high matters, and this defect in them overshadowed their wisdom. And therefore I asked myself on behalf of the oracle whether I would like to be as I was, neither having their knowledge nor their ignorance, or like them in both. And I made answer to myself and to the oracle that I was better off as I was. This inquisition has led to my having many enemies of the worst and most dangerous kind, and has given occasion also to many calumnies. And I am called wise, for my hearers always imagine that I myself possess the wisdom which I find wanting in others, but the truth is, O men of Athens, that God only is wise, and by his answer he intends to show that the wisdom of men is worth little or nothing. He is not speaking of Socrates, he is only using my name as a way of illustration, as if he said, He, O men, is the wisest who, like Socrates, knows that his wisdom is in truth worth nothing. 
And so I go about the world, obedient to the God, and search and make inquiry into the wisdom of anyone, whether citizen or stranger, who appears to be wise. And if he is not wise, then in vindication of the oracle, I show him that he is not wise. And my occupation quite absorbs me, and I have no time to give either to any public matters of interest or to any concern of my own. But I am in utter poverty by reason of my devotion to the God. There is another thing. Young men of the richer classes, who have not much to do, come about me of their own accord. They like to hear the pretenders examined, and they often imitate me, and proceed to examine others. There are plenty of persons, as they quickly discover, who think that they know something, but really know little or nothing. And then those who are examined by them, instead of being angry with themselves, are angry with me. This confounded Socrates, they say this villainous misleader of youth, and then if somebody asks them why, what evil does he practice or teach, they do not know and cannot tell. But in order that they may not appear to be at a loss, they repeat the ready-made charges which are used against all philosophers about teaching things up in the clouds and under the earth and having no gods and making the worse appear the better cause. For they do not like to confess that their pretense of knowledge has been detected, which is the truth. Strange indeed would be my conduct, O men of Athens, if I who, when I was ordered by the generals whom you chose to command me at Potidea, Amphibolus, and Delium, remained where they placed me, like any other man facing death, if now, when, as I conceive and imagine, God orders me to fulfill the philosopher's mission of searching into myself and other men, I were to desert my post through fear of death, or any other fear, that would indeed be strange, and I might justly be arraigned in court for denying the existence of the gods, if I disobeyed the oracle because I was afraid of death fancying that I was wise when I was not wise. For the fear of death is indeed the pretense of wisdom, and not real wisdom, being a pretense of knowing the unknown. If you say to me, Socrates, this time we will not mind, and you shall be let off, but upon one condition, that you are not to inquire and speculate in this way any more, and that if you are caught doing so again, you shall die. If this was the condition on which you let me go, I should reply, Men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I shall obey God rather than you. And while I have life and strength, I shall never cease from the practice and teaching of philosophy, exhorting anyone whom I meet, and saying to him after my manner, You, my friend, a citizen of the great and mighty and wise city of Athens, are you not ashamed? of heaping up the greatest amount of money and honor and reputation, and caring so little about wisdom and truth and the greatest improvement of the soul? I believe that no greater good has ever happened in the state than my service to the God. I tell you that virtue is not given by money, but that from virtue comes money and every other good of man, public as well as private. This is my teaching. And if this is the doctrine which corrupts the youth, I am a mischievous person. And now, Athenians, I am not going to argue for my own sake, as you may think, but for yours, that you may not sin against the God by condemning me, who am his gift to you. I am that gadfly which God has attached to the state, and all day long, in all places, am always fastening upon you, arousing and persuading and reproaching you. You will not easily find another like me, and therefore I would advise you to spare me. Throughout my life, both in private and public, I have always been the same and have never yielded unjustly to anyone. I was never anyone's teacher. I have never withheld myself from anyone, young or old, who was anxious to hear me discuss while I was making my investigation. Neither do I discuss for payment and refuse to discuss without payment. I am ready to ask questions of rich and poor alike, and if any man wishes to answer me and then listen to what I say, he may. Now, in trials like this, it was not uncommon for the defendant to attempt to appeal to the jury's pity. Some would, for example, beg and implore the jury with tears in their eyes, bring out their children and friends and family who would then 
plead that the court would have pity so that the judgment would be less severe. Socrates would have no part in this because he recognized rightly that the appeal to pity is actually a fallacious appeal. At this point in the trial, the vote is taken, and Socrates is found to be guilty by 281 votes to 220. After the verdict of guilty was rendered, Socrates was given the option to suggest what he thought to be a fair punishment. Humorous as he was, he supposes, well, what would such a man as he deserve? A man who was the gadfly of Athens, who continually reminded Athens to keep their perspective in check, to remember that they don't know as much as they think they know. What would be the penalty for beseeching Athens to seek wisdom? He decides, nothing is more suitable, gentlemen, than for such a man to be fed in the Prytaneum or the cafeteria. If I must make a just assessment of what I deserve, I assess it as this, free meals in the Prytaneum. Knowing, of course, that this will not be acceptable to them, he replies, There are many reasons why I am not grieved. I cannot convince you. The time has been too short. I cannot in a moment refute great slanderers. Someone will say, Yes, Socrates, but can you not hold your tongue, and then you may go into a foreign city and no one will interfere with you? Now, I have great difficulty in making you understand my answer to this, for if I tell you that to do as you say would be a disobedience to the God, and therefore I cannot hold my tongue, you will not believe that I am serious. And if I say again that daily to discourse about virtue and of those other things about which you hear me examining myself and others is the greatest good of man, and that the unexamined life is not worth living, you are still less likely to believe me. Yes, I say what is true, although a thing of which it is hard for me to persuade you. Also, I have never been accustomed to think that I deserve to suffer any harm. Money, I have none. Well, perhaps I could afford a mina, and therefore I propose that penalty. Plato, Crito, Critobulus, and Apollodorus, my friends here, bid me say 30 minae and they will be the sureties. Let 30 minae be the penalty. At this point, there is a second vote, and the jury decides for the death penalty by a vote of 360 to 141. Socrates responds, Not much time will be gained, O Athenians, in return for the evil name which you will get from the detractors of the city who will say that you killed Socrates, a wise man. For they will call me wise, even although I am not wise, when they want to reproach you. If you had waited a little while, your desire would have been fulfilled in the course of nature. For I am far advanced in years, as you may perceive, and not far from death. The difficulty, my friends, is not to avoid death, but to avoid unrighteousness, for that runs faster than death. And now I depart hence condemned by you to suffer the penalty of death. They too go their ways, condemned by the truth to suffer the penalty of villainy and wrong. And I must abide by my award. Let them abide by theirs. Let us reflect in another way, and we shall see that there is great reason to hope that death is good. For one of two things, either death is a state of nothingness and utter unconsciousness, or, as men say, there is a change and migration of the soul from this world to another. Now, if you suppose that there is no consciousness but a sleep, death will be an unspeakable gain. Now, if death be of such a nature, I say that to die is gain, for eternity is then only a single night. But if death is the journey to another place, and there, as men say, all the dead abide, what good, O oh my friends and judges, can be greater than this? If indeed, when the pilgrim arrives in the world below, he is delivered from the professors of justice in this world, and finds the true judges who are said to give judgment there, and other sons of God,
who were righteous in their own life, that pilgrimage will be worth making. Nay, if this be true, let me die again and again. Above all, I shall then be able to continue my search into true and false knowledge, as in this world, so also in the next. And I shall find out who is wise, and who pretends to be wise, and is not. Wherefore, O judges, be of good cheer about death, and know of a certainty that no evil can happen to a good man, either in life or after death. He and his are not neglected by the gods. But I see clearly that the time has arrived when it was better for me to die and be released from trouble. Still, I have a favor to ask. When my sons are grown up, I would ask of you, O my friends, to punish them, and I would have you trouble them, as I have troubled you. If they seem to care about riches or anything more than about virtue, or if they pretend to be something when they are really nothing, then reprove them, as I have reproved you, for not caring about that for which they ought to care, and thinking that they are something when they are really nothing. If you do this, both I and my sons will have received justice at your hands. The hour of departure has arrived, and we go our ways, I to die and you to live, which is better, God only knows. So with the apology, Socrates draws a line from the start between himself and his accusers, and he has some early accusers and some later accusers in his life. Then he moves on. He gives his defense. Then we have the verdict. He has a reply. Then we have the sentence. He has his final remarks. The early accusers say that he investigates things up in the heavens and under the earth. This was a common charge against philosophers in general at the time. He makes weaker arguments into stronger ones. He teaches these things to others for pay. What does that sound like? Sophistry. So he was being accused of sophistry. He replies with the story of the Oracle of Delphi and how he came to take upon his profession and his process. So the God of Delphi said Socrates is the wisest man. He didn't believe that, so he stopped, set out on a quest questioning politicians and poets and craftsmen. Surely if I can find one person that is wiser than I, then that will refute that puzzling statement from the Oracle of the Five. The later accusers say he has been corrupting the youth. Well, what is the corruption? The corruption is he is causing the youth to imitate him and causing problems. Socrates is causing problems. These youth admire him, and they are imitating him, and they are causing all sorts of problems. Does he willingly corrupt or unwillingly? Is it even corruption? They even raise the question of whether Socrates believes in the gods at all. Socrates responds by saying he does what he does because he is driven by the conviction which came from a god. He says if they kill him, they will harm themselves more than they harm him. Because it's almost like the God has given you, O city of Athens, one like me, to continually poke at your confidence and to remind you that you don't know what you think you do and to point out these problems in your assertions of knowledge. Of course, you don't want to hear that, which is why I'm on trial now. He does not respect any political parties. He doesn't have time to get into all the politics. He doesn't even have time to secure his own wealth, which is why he's in poverty. He points out that he's no one's teacher, but he will speak with anyone in search for wisdom. He also avoids the appeal to pity. It was not uncommon in that time for people on trial to bring out their families and you know, put on a whole show of tears and try to move. the. That was a sophist trick, by the way to try to move the judges, the audience, by appealing to their emotions. Socrates recognizes that for what it is, and he doesn't even attempt to go there, even though that might have worked better for him. Finally, we get the verdict. Socrates then has an opportunity to propose a penalty, and he does. Three meals of the Pritanium. Of course, he's kidding. He knows they won't take it seriously. He goes on to say that there's a difference between feeling happy and being happy in order to press the point that the Athenians are really committing an injustice against themselves by killing unjustly the one who is there to keep their perspective in check. Because wickedness is more difficult to avoid than death. 
death is easy. He says, you know what? If you wanted me dead, all you had to do was wait. I'm almost there anyway. But instead, you've decided to commit injustice. But that's fine because death is easy. Wickedness, however, is difficult to avoid. And your hands are all in it. Moreover, I welcome death. Because death is one of two things. Either it is an eternal sleep. Once it's here, I'll never know it. And the burdens will cease. On the other hand, the other alternative is that death is not like sleep, but there is an afterlife or a migration of the soul to another place. And there I will get to see the real judges, the ones who really have a, a deeper understanding of truth, and even those who have modeled goodness in their life. That will be fantastic for one like me because then I get to keep searching to understand truth. I get to dialogue with those sorts of people. You, however, are stuck here in your wickedness. And back to the point about the difference between feeling and being happy, Socrates believed that only the just are happy. It doesn't matter what one does to my body. If I know justice, then I will know happiness. However, one who knows not justice can never be happy because there is something wrong with the soul. So you Athenians, so quick, to run to injustice are only causing scars upon your soul. Because if there is no understanding of justice there, there is no happiness there either. And you're killing off the one who is here to remind you that you're not asking the right questions, that you think you know more than you actually do, and that if you want to find happiness and you want to understand justice, you've got to ask different sorts of questions. After the trial, Plato's credo then takes place. When Socrates is about to be executed, credo argues that Socrates should escape, and they've been making arrangements, but Socrates examines whether or not this would be right. He wants to listen to the wise, not just anyone, because the health of the soul is the most important. He gives an argument, they realize they can't refute it, therefore he refuses to escape. Here's the argument. One must never do wrong, because to do wrong is in every way harmful and shameful to the wrongdoer, and because doing wrong harms the part of ourselves that is more valuable. It's an injustice against our soul. Second, one must never return a wrong for a wrong. Third, to injure others or treat them unjustly is to do wrong to them. So, from points two and three, one must never injure others. Fifth, to violate a just agreement is to do injury to another. Six, to escape would be to violate a just agreement with the laws of the city. He goes into a poetic inner dialogue between himself and the laws of the city. In finding himself in the city of Athens, aware of its laws, he has the choice to stay and continue to live there accepting the parameters of Athenian law or to leave. All his life he's been free to leave. He decided to stay. Therefore, he concludes, in choosing to stay and not leave prior to this inconvenience, I chose to agree to the laws. If I made an agreement when it was convenient to agree, I cannot just now violate that agreement because the laws that I agreed to are now inconvenient for me. That would be an injustice. Therefore, he concludes, to escape would be an injury to the laws of Athens. Therefore, to escape would be wrong. 